thank you very much. Um, they gave me some water here, but I think the way I'm wired, if I drip anything on myself, you're going to see quite a fireworks exhibition. Um, so I'll try to keep away from the water. I'd like to thank every, everybody for coming here. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Minimed course, uh, especially for asking me to speak here. I'm not sure I want to thank them for asking me to be the first speaker, but I'll, I'll thank them for asking me to speak in general. Um, I have quite a, uh, a task ahead of me. Uh, the task is to try to teach you everything there is about infectious diseases in, well, it was supposed to be 50 minutes, but it's ground down to 40 minutes. And anybody who knows me knows that what happens when people take time away from me is I just talk faster. And uh, for those of you who already know how I speak, talking faster can be, can be quite something to behold. So I will try to keep to the time limit. Um, and if I start to, uh, to ramble, you'll just let me know. Um, starting off, I guess it would be really easy to just say, germs are everywhere, deal with it. Okay, well that's one way of looking at it, but it's, it's not quite that easy. These are the three things that I hope to be able to transmit to you tonight, all right? The three things that you have to understand in order to deal with germs or bugs or whatever vernacular word you want to use for them. You have to understand the various types of germs and how they cause disease and how to treat them. And that's the discipline of infectious diseases. And when Mr. Tobe says that he sits outside of the infectious disease clinic and before the talk he said to me, you know, you should really write a book about what goes on there and uh, for uh, my son knows this because he knows that for 10 years I've been talking about writing a book what goes on there uh, it, it's quite a spectacle um, but it is it is a very interesting field but the diagnosis and therapy of infectious diseases you really have to understand the bugs themselves the other part of infectious diseases is where to find those bugs how to find them to diagnose them and detect them even when they're present in extremely tiny quantities and we're talking about infection sometimes like tuberculosis or malaria, things like that where you're looking for one bacteria, um, certainly things like West Nile virus and SARS where you're looking for just a few viruses in an entire body and the, the methods that we have to use to track them down can be quite formidable. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that tonight and where we're heading in the future both globally and here at the Jewish. And the last thing which, is spends an enorm which we spend an enormous amount of time on here and that's prevention and control of infection, is how to prevent the spread of these germs and stop them from causing widespread problems. As you've heard, some of them actually do occur in the hospital. Obviously, we have sick people in the hospital, but many of these infections occur outside the hospital as well. And you'll, you'll see a little bit about that. So these are tonight's topics, infectious diseases, clinical microbiology, and infection prevention and control. And we're gonna go through them one at a time. But first, what do you know about infections? And I'm always amazed and I don't mean this in a negative way, but, but I'm, I'm always amazed by the ignorance of individuals in terms of infectious diseases. We know infectious diseases that occur here in North America or in our city, but we rarely know about infectious diseases that affect the global community and that have a major impact on society in general. So what do you know about infectious diseases? Well, they are the most significant diseases that have probably affected world history in general. Um, and they are still affecting our everyday life. All you have to do is look at how the economy of Canada was affected by the SARS epidemic in Toronto to understand how one disease in one place has far-reaching effects on everything, society, economy, the whole structure of our, of our being, both in North America and elsewhere. The diseases which cause the most panic and attention, which are in the news media all the time, are almost always infectious diseases. All right, and I think you can all think of examples. And I would say, of course I'm biased, is that they're the most interesting diseases, but I think all the speakers will get up and tell you that. So we used to be afraid of sharks, and I remember the days of Jaws. But now, we're all afraid of E. coli. 
Um, and we have new predators among us, and E. coli is one of them. When I was a medical student, if I had an audience this big, I challenge if there were five people who knew what E. coli was, all right? Today, if I say E. coli, immediately everybody goes Walkerton, hamburger disease, um, food poisoning, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And even if you don't know it, you've heard it, you've seen it, you've read about it, all right? The world has changed enormously in terms of what the media is telling us and what we should be afraid of. Now, I'm not going to fear monger you tonight. I'm going to do the opposite. By telling you about infectious diseases and the germs that cause them, I'm hoping that you have some rational and reasonable approach to them and not fear the things that you shouldn't be fearing. And we'll get to that. But we get bombarded everywhere. We get bombarded in the workplace. Here's an, a Gazette article on beware of workplace bugs. Germs can survive up to three days on office equipment. So you read this article and you never ever want to go to work again. You know, except that the next article tells you how dangerous your kitchen is. So you never go into the kitchen. And then of course you hear how awful your, your toilet water is. So you never go to the bathroom. And, and you'll wind up sitting in a closet somewhere in the dark wondering how the germs are going to get to you. Um, but this is what we're bombarded with. Now, talking about the bathroom, we get bombarded in our homes. Here's a little ad that I cut out recently for Lysol. Kills 99.9% .9 of germs in your toilet. My question to you is, is this really important? When was the last time any of us went over to take a nice, cool, refreshing drink from our toilet? <laughs> You know, maybe our dogs do, and even that, you know, I'm not sure that happens anymore. But we don't drink from the toilet, so how important is it to run after these germs with bleach and all kinds of disinfectants? We're not drinking from it. And then, of course, if you read the ad carefully, which nobody ever does, and I did not make this up, it says here, maximum efficacy on average three flushes per hour. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, the whole thing is why would you even want this? And number two is you'll never achieve this because nobody flushes our toilet three times an hour. And you know, you're out of the home, et cetera, and then it loses its effectiveness, and who really cares? So you wind up spending three, four, five dollars on a product that you never really needed, and it's this whole fear mongering attitude that goes on with infectious diseases, which we have to combat every day when people walk in. I have people walking in all summer now asking for West Nile virus blood testing. Why? Because their finger is red, and they heard somewhere that red fingers can be a sign of West Nile, so they're sitting there with their arm, you know, with their sleeve up and they want a blood test. This is the kind of fear that goes on in the community. Here's another example. Even where we eat, this is a restaurant in Toronto that, that is promising you that their hamburgers are pasteurized so that you don't have to worry about E. coli. And not only E. coli, but E. coli 0157H7, which is the one that causes hamburger disease, but of course you don't know that. But you see the numbers and you go, wow, they really know what they're talking about. And they care about me. And that's what it says in the pamphlet is because we care about you, we're pasteurizing our hamburger meat. And of course, that's really nice, and it's true, it does kill E. coli, but you can do the same thing just by cooking it properly. And of course, every single day, we've got the threat of bioterrorism. So we've got envelopes, and we've got white powder, and you know, I, I, I really, I know that 50 years from now, we'll look back on this time, and I don't know if we're going to laugh or cry, but having lived through all of this in Montreal, with envelopes being sent here, hither and yonder, with white powder in it, um, you know, and going through all of this approach, this can really be a frightening thing in and of itself. I can tell you that the U.S. Army has just finished vaccinating 600,000 people for smallpox in preparation for a possible smallpox bioterrorist attack. And it's this kind of news and this kind of preparation, which of course they have to do, which kind of fuels the whole fear of this. And of course, it makes it into the funnies as well. Here's a great cartoon that came out during the anthrax scare, where you know, if you if you take Cipro, of course, Cipro was the treatment for anthrax, and Prozac is the treatment for everything else we're worried about. So if you're worried about anthrax, you put it together and you come up with a great new Pfizer drug. Although uh, <laughs> Pfizer doesn't make Cipro, you come up with a great drug called Ciprozac, and that way you don't have to worry about anthrax or the fear of anthrax. And I thought this was very cute. And of course, you know, here's a great little cartoon, and for 
those of us in infection control, you know the old daddy, daddy, I hurt my finger, let me kiss it. And then the kid, of course, is a, is a kid growing up in the year 2000s who says, you know, daddy, that doesn't seem very hygienic and antibacterial to me <laughs> because you shouldn't really be kissing my finger that way. Um, and, you know, she's right, but, you know, we still do these things. So what do you know about infectious diseases in general after everybody's gotten to you with all of these things, right? Well, you probably don't know very much, as I didn't before I got into this field. You know, there have been large-scale pandemics ever since there was humankind on the face of the earth. There was the famous bubonic plague going back to the 6th century. There were probably plagues before this, but these are the first recorded ones. Look at the numbers. Now, let's start comparing the numbers to SARS and West Nile, all right? You're talking about 100 million deaths and 142 million people affected by bubonic plague at the time when they started keeping records of this. Look even in the early 1900s at the Spanish flu pandemic. Everybody keeps talking about another pandemic coming, another pandemic. You know, you think SARS was bad. 21 million deaths in the early 1900s during the Spanish flu. In New York City alone, every week, 5,000 people died of the flu. All right? Again, I would ask you all in the audience, how many of you get the flu vaccine to prevent this from occurring again? And if you're all like the general population, it's under 65%. And yet the flu, is, flu vaccine is free, without many side effects, and available pretty much everywhere in the city and in the country for that matter. So let's start talking about what we should be afraid of and how to prepare for these types of things. Important diseases today, I talk about these diseases at the supper table with my kids and they go, well, that, does, that disease doesn't occur anymore. Or when a patient walks in and I say, well, I think you have tuberculosis, they go, tuberculosis? I thought that was gone in the 1930s. Well, hey guys, it's not gone. There's a million deaths from malaria every year in the world and there's 400 million brand new cases of infection every year. All right, tuberculosis, 8 million new cases and 10, 2 million deaths. And of course, AIDS everybody hears about, but nobody really knows the extent of this unless you actually sit down and look at the figures. 6 million new cases every year and 3 million deaths. And this ad is absolutely true. This was in Time magazine last week, okay? In seven years from now, there will be 25 million children who will be orphaned by AIDS just in Africa alone. All right. You're talking about a burden of disease in an area of the world where they don't have access to the therapies that we have here. So again, this huge, and you're going to see this over and over again with infectious diseases. The bulk of infectious diseases are in areas of the world where they have no way to combat it. And we who have all the resources, Western Europe, North America, to some extent South America, have much less of a burden, but we have all the resources to handle it. A big discrepancy in the global distribution of being able to manage infectious diseases. Now, what about some recent high-profile infections? Well, you all know about SARS, okay, and yes, SARS can cripple an economy when people get anxious, but a lot of this was due to the anxiety and the fear and not the disease itself. But it just goes to show you what can happen in a population when you start seeding fear, and of course, that's what bioterrorists want to do. There were only 662 deaths, I'm saying only, that's a lot, but there were only 662 deaths worldwide. And there were about 8,000 cases here in Canada. We had 43 deaths among 251 cases. Of course, the real thing that hit us hard, those of us in healthcare, is that the bulk of these deaths and infections were amongst healthcare workers, those of us who were helping those afflicted with the disease. And that's the first time in recent memory that there's an infectious disease that hit healthcare workers harder than the patients. And that's where the fear entered into the hospitals. West Nile virus you all know about. Four cases in Montreal now, presumptively. Everybody's panicking and freaking. The vast majority of people who get this infection are sick for five or six days. No big deal. Deaths are unusual. Long-term complications are rare. And everybody's freaking out. Monkeypox, a few cases in the United States from some prairie dogs that somebody imported. This is the big problem for those of us who work every day in infectious diseases, the superbugs. The superbugs, the bacteria that have become resistant to antibiotics because we use too much antibiotics, because every time somebody sniffles or coughs and runs to their doctor, 
They beg for antibiotics and won't leave until they get a prescription. Overuse of antibiotics in the veterinary field, all right, cows and pigs and sheep getting antibiotics as part of their feed to promote growth so that when you get the meat and it's tainted with bacteria, sometimes those bacteria are multi-resistant. This is what's happening in the, in, in the world today with infectious diseases is overuse and misuse of antibiotics are leading to superbugs and the hospitals are breeding grounds for these superbugs because the hospitals are where most antibiotics are prescribed in a very close-knit way. You've got a very small population with a lot of antibiotic use, okay? There's much more antibiotic use going on in the community, but it's spread out amongst households and amongst the population. In the hospital, it's concentrated. And then, of course, you have the bioterrorism, which is very high profile recently. So what do they all have in common that everybody's freaking about? Well, they all involve North America. But how many of you are aware of these recent infectious diseases, and I mean recent, like in the past few months, that do not affect North America, but you don't know about them because the media doesn't feed them to you? These are the ones that we deal with all the time as well because they're imported, but you don't hear about them because it's, it, it's the media picks and chooses what you're going to hear and what they're going to educate you about, and it's our job to educate you about the global impact of infectious diseases. Ebola fever, just in the past three years, 128 deaths among 143 cases, mostly healthcare workers in Africa caring for these people. Okay, it does not transmit easily. It's not highly contagious, but very highly lethal. Cholera, when I ask people, are you aware of the cholera outbreak in South America in the past few years? Everybody goes, cholera, South America? For the first time in 90 years, cholera surfaced in the early 90s and only was starting to taper in the mid-90s, 1.1 million people affected with cholera with over 10,000 deaths, all right? And yet nobody in North America heard about this. It was in the newspaper, I think, two days, and that was it. Cholera, just this year, now because of the social unrest in Liberia and Mozambique, 16,000 cases. We don't even know how many deaths because nobody's keeping track out there. There's nobody who's organized enough to keep track of the numbers. And of course, everybody goes, wow, bubonic plague, is that still around? Yes, bubonic plague is still around. There are still cases every day around the world, not in North America, but elsewhere. Yes, bubonic plague has not been eradicated. So, no wonder we're all obsessed with these bugs. The question is, where do you lie on the spectrum here? Are you one of these individuals who's totally paranoid and believes that there's bugs and germs and viruses everywhere, and you've got to walk around and wash your hands and wear gloves and not touch anybody? Or are you one of these individuals who's apathetic? Or do you lie somewhere in between? Well, the person who is paranoid, as an example, you know, says, oh my God, there's germs all over the telephone. I've got to wipe the telephone every time somebody uses it. I can't touch it. You know, you have to understand certain things. The human body and almost every environmental surface, everything in this room, is covered with billions of bacteria and fungi all the time. Most of these are what we call friendly bacteria. These bacteria are there that actually compete with the bad ones and keep them away from our system and keep us healthy. The billions of bacteria in your mouth and in your intestinal tract keep you healthy and keep the bad bacteria and viruses from infecting you most of the time. So there are good bugs and there are bad bugs and to be afraid of all bugs is unreasonable. Trying to maintain a sterile environment is crazy and good common sense hygiene is what we always say. It doesn't mean that you can cough and spit all over the phone and then hand it to your friend. What it means is that you shouldn't be afraid of the phone and the table and the, st and the, ch and the chairs and everything else and the microphone that you're touching, all right? But there's some reasonable common sense approaches here to do. Now, unfortunately, a lot of companies monopolize on our paranoia of bacteria and viruses and these bugs. And there are antibacterial detergents and soaps around, and you're gonna see everything now says antibacterial on it, eh? For the, for the kitchen, you've gotta have antibacterial soap, and for the toilet, you've gotta have antibacterial um, disinfectants. And most of this stuff is wasted money because good soap and water does the same job, if not better, all right? And good surface disinfection and cleaning does just 
just as good a job. And unless you're really in a hospital environment or in an operating room where there are strict criteria to stick to, most normal common sense approaches are sufficient to keep us healthy. There are antiseptic paint and furniture coverings that are being made now to kind of convince people that we have to have a sterile environment. Telephone covers, this is a great little ad that somebody mailed to me. They said, Dr. Miller, you're in charge of infection control for the hospital. You need telephone covers because your telephones are dirty and they're a source of contamination for your patients. So we're prepared to sell you telephone pads. Rubbish, I say, don't bother us, okay? Water purifiers, everybody's selling water purifiers, air purifiers. Everybody's obsessed with not just cleanliness, but a sterile environment, which is totally ridiculous. Then of course, there's the other extreme. There's the apathy, it's just as bad. The people who go to the toilet and don't wash their hands. The people who prepare undercooked beef or chicken in the kitchen and don't wash their hands. People who sneeze and wipe their nose and then go and shake your hand, okay, without washing their hands because, you know, it's just what they do, they're friendly. You know, people having, you know, I deal with sexually transmitted diseases a lot of the time in our clinic. You can't be shy about sexually transmitted diseases. If you don't talk to adolescents and young adults and older adults too about condoms and safe sex, they're going to get sexually transmitted diseases. Having casual sex without a condom or a barrier is foolhardy and apathetic. It's the same apathy. And those individuals who travel to India and some continent and Africa and Asia every year on vacation and don't get their vaccines and don't take their malaria pills and then wind up back in our emergency room with fevers of 105 near death, this is the typical apathy that goes on. Oh, I didn't know that malaria still existed where I was traveling to. I didn't know I had to do that. Okay. So what is normal? Normal is somewhere in between paranoia and apathy and where that is, is essentially, um, you know, where the reasonable approach lies, okay? Unfortunately, we are all subject to these misconceptions and fear mongering that goes on all the time by friends, by, by the media, you know, how many times do I have somebody in the clinic who walks in with a simple um, infection, they've cut themselves while they're cooking or while they're repairing something and they come in because their friend told them, you know, that could be flesh eating disease. So you should go to the infectious disease clinic because you know tomorrow you may not have a hand anymore. So they wind up coming in and they say, and they always start off and they go, you know, I wouldn't be here, but my friend told me da 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 da. So you know, we're all subject to this kind of propagation of information and it's up to us to kind of weed out what's real and what's not. So that's why you're here tonight. So everybody's worried about flesh eating disease. I can't tell you how many days goes by that I hear somebody telling me, that they think they have flesh eating or are you sure it's not flesh eating? Okay, but your chance of being hit by lightning in Montreal, which is about one in 280,000, is actually higher than your getting flesh eating disease, which is about one in half a million. Not to say that you shouldn't be concerned when you have a bad infection, but not everything that's red and that hurts is flesh eating disease, okay? Another example. People are much more likely, and this really gets me, you're scheduled for surgery. What are the questions you're going to ask your surgeon? This is what you ask. How many days will I be off work? When can I start driving again? How big will my incision be? Because you know, I really, I wanna wear a bathing suit and I don't want it to show, all right? People never ask the important questions. What are the important questions? What are my chance of getting an infection after this surgery? What can I do to reduce that risk, okay? All kinds of questions that I'm sure you're not even aware of. How many of you are aware that most hospitals, large hospitals in Canada, reuse disposable medical devices? Okay, it's true. Most Canadian hospitals reuse devices that are made for single use only because of budgetary constraints. They resubmit them for processing and for cleaning and sterilization. This hospital several years ago decided that this was an unsafe practice and stopped it. We were one of the leaders in the community to do this. Now everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. The United States has forbidden it, okay? Canada is kind of lagging, but how many of you know enough that when you go into to surgery
surgery or before you go into surgery, whatever hospital it might be, to ask the surgeon, oh, by the way, are you aware if you're using re single-use devices, reusing single-use devices in your hospital, and will I have a single-use device that's been reused on me? Okay, how many of you have asked, what's the chance of me getting an infection after this surgery? All right, and nobody asks, but the single most important complication which is going to affect you during your recovery from surgery is going to be a hospital acquired, surgical acquired, whatever you want to call it. We call it nosocomial, nosocomial infection. All right, and yet people don't ask that. They're much more concerned with the other stuff. Okay, now that doesn't mean that you should be totally afraid of surgery, but nobody wants to talk about this until a celebrity talks about it. Do you all remember this? Okay, Rosie O'Donnell was on a fishing trip and she cut her palm with a fishing knife, okay? And what happened was she went to the hospital, they sewed her up in the emergency room, she got the typical VIP treatment in a lovely Hollywood hospital, went back home, developed high fevers, chills, she was feeling less lousy, she went back to the hospital and essentially she almost died, it's true, she almost died from staph septicemia, from a staph infection, which is a bacteria that entered into the cut when it was sewn up in her palm. When she talked about this, all of a sudden I was getting media interviews for staph infections, hospital infections. Of course, we live this every day. We try to avoid these, we treat them, we try to, but nobody wants to talk about it until Rosie O'Donnell talks about it. Then everybody wants to hear about it. Okay, unfortunately, in our lives in infection diseases, we can't rely on Rosie O'Donnell to spread the word. Okay, nobody knew about flesh eating disease until Mr. Bouchard lost a leg to it. All right. Um, running the risk of infection doesn't mean that you have to avoid surgery. What it means is that you have to be informed about your surgery, about your medical procedures, you have to be informed about the risks, and you have to ask how you can decrease those risks, okay? We advocate people taking antibacterial soaps for this particular type of indication before they come in for surgery. We have set protocols for how to clean the skin and how to do things like that when you come in. Um, all this is what I call concerned consumerism. You're the consumers. Okay, now you're our patients, but you're also the consumers of healthcare. And it's up to you to be informed and to come in and say, I'm gonna have my gallbladder taken out, I'm coming in to have major kidney surgery, whatever it is, what can I do to keep my risk of infection down? So you can ask about the scar, everybody wants a small scar, but you also have to be informed about the rest of it. Yet another example, West Nile virus. Everybody's worried about West Nile virus. I have people coming into my office and telling me they don't go out in the summer anymore now because there's cases of West Nile. So they're not going to their garden and they're not going out and they're not going to the country and they're, they're spraying themselves from stem to stern with, anti, uh, with insecticide because they don't want to get bitten. Everybody's concerned about West Nile virus. But nobody asks me, oh, by the way, is the pneumonia vaccine available this year? Can I get the pneumonia vaccine? Is it free of charge? Is it good? You know, you are much more likely to come down with pneumonia in the next 12 months than you are with West Nile virus. Have any of you become informed about whether you are eligible for the pneumonia vaccine, where you can get it, what its effectiveness is, whether you're at risk? Okay, I can tell you right now that in Montreal, in Quebec, the province of Quebec, the pneumonia vaccine is free of charge for anybody over the age of 65 who presents to their CLSC or our clinic for that matter. All right, it is 80% effective in reducing your risk of pneumonia. And and as somebody who gets on in age, of course not me, but the rest of you, as you get on in age, you become more and more at risk for pneumonia, and that's why the vaccine is an extremely effective way of preventing this type of infection. But everybody's concerned about West Nile virus. So, what do we have at the Jewish General? So we're gonna move a little bit away from the globe and talk about the Jewish General and how in these three areas, what do we offer? Very similar to other hospitals, and how do we differ? We have a huge walk-in clinic that Mr. Tobe has told you about. The uniqueness of our clinic is that it is purely walk-in, no appointment. You can't deal with appointments with infectious diseases because you have an infection now, you need it treated now. So we're open from 9 to 11.30 every morning, and some mornings there's 15 people, and some mornings
means there's 45 people. And when there's 45 people, 25 of them are asking Mr. Tobe where the clinic is. And they don't want to tell him why they're coming to the clinic because half of them are sexually transmitted diseases, the other half are cat bites and dog bites and pneumonias and other things that have gone on and surgical infections, et cetera, et cetera. But a very big clinic. We have um, a very large referral base from the emergency department. We have a separate TB clinic. TB in Montreal. TB has become such a major issue because of the diversity of the ethnic groups in this city that TB became so important we had to extend our infectious disease clinic and make a dedicated TB clinic in the afternoons just to handle these people. Um, we have a lot of inpatient consultations for everybody who comes into the hospital. We've got a home IV antibiotic program, which I'll tell you about, and we've got teaching and research. The lab I'm going to show you about, we have a huge clinical lab for the detection of all kinds of infectious diseases with a huge array of diagnostic tests. And we have the Infection Prevention and Control Unit, which is an on-site assistance group to give education and uh, all kinds of interventions to prevent hospital-acquired infections. So let's talk about the clinic first. The the clinic has five full-time physicians and support staff, including myself. Our walk-in clinic sees almost 6,000 people per year. Our TB clinic alone sees 2,000 patients per year. And in the hospital, just the inpatients, we see between 12 and 15,000 people with infections. And the simple ones are taken care of by our colleagues without calling us. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. We deal with everything. We're not shy. We deal with gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, and genital warfare in our clinic, somebody has to. We have a lot of adolescents. I saw a girl this morning, 16 years old, from high school coming in with her guidance counselor because these are the people who need help, okay? And they have nowhere else to go. We deal with, uh, in our infectious disease clinic, we talk about condoms and safe sex, hepatitis and HIV AIDS. We have a large group of AIDS patients here, HIV infected, large hepatitis C population. We see 40 to 50 cases of active TB every year here and we have thousands of contacts of those people who've been infected or exposed who have to go through all kinds of case finding, x-rays and skin testing, etc. So we deal with a lot of what we call prophylaxis or preventive treatment in all these contacts and we have a tremendous interaction with the public health department. In the, we deal with all the community and hospital acquired infections and everybody always says to me, oh great, infectious diseases, so, so, so what do you do? What do you see? Well, we deal with pneumonias, we deal with all kinds of animal bites and injuries in the community, okay? I can't tell you, in April, we start seeing all the squirrel bites come in. Everybody wants to feed the squirrels, okay? Then everybody has their own cat and dog bites that go with it, everybody comes in with puncture wounds. People go out in the summer, there's a lot more activities, people come in with all kinds of injuries that get infected. We deal with a lot of post-surgical infections, both from here and from elsewhere, and we have a lot of patients with abnormal immune systems, everybody getting chemotherapy, radiotherapy, everybody with leukemia, lymphoma, they are at high risk for infection and most of them get at least one infection during their course. We see them. The thing that always irritates me, just a little splinter under the skin, is that we'll have somebody with leukemia, unfortunately, who goes through rigorous chemotherapy, does great on their chemotherapy, their cancer is in remission, and unfortunately they come down with a life-threatening infection they come to us, we diagnose them, we treat them, we save their lives, they're indebted to the hospital, and of course they give to the leukemia fund. And of course, infectious diseases, well, infectious, you know, thanks a lot. You know, so we're, we're kind of used to that, we're kind of the poor cousin here, but we, we like it all the same. And then we have the interesting but rare diseases that we see all the time, but you know, nobody really wants to talk about them. Every summer, everybody goes home, to Asia, India, Africa, comes back with their malaria. We've got viral diseases and fungal diseases. We have great tropical diseases, which are always fun to deal with. And we've got the unfortunate rare infections in patients with abnormal immune systems. I remember when a patient walked into the emergency room and she walked in and she said to the nurse, she says, I really need to see somebody. And the nurse said, well, 
you know, what's the problem? She says, well, I was standing in the bathroom this morning and I just kind of coughed and, and, I, and I brought up this worm, you know? And, and so she brings up this worm in a little jar that she brought in. And so right away the nurse just goes, well, have a seat. And she turns to the doctor and goes, call infectious diseases. Don't, eat, don't even, I mean, you know, that's it's the automatic knee-jerk response. Somebody walks in, you don't want to deal with it, call infectious diseases. You know, so we go down and, oh, yeah, you know, you picked up whatever, whatever, wherever you were, and you now here's your treatment. We do lots of studies in the, in the division. This is just a small group of, of what we do recently. We've been doing herpes simplex vaccines. We've been doing therapies for overwhelming infections like septic shock. We have tried new antibiotics for the treatment of skin and soft tissue infections. We have a great new study going on right now, an antibiotic that's given once a week so that you only have to take one injection once a week instead of taking pills every day. We're very excited about that one. We have new antibiotics for the treatment of pneumonia. We have new antibiotics and treatments for our HIV patients. We even underdid a uh, therapy for the common cold study two years ago um, and, and a bunch of other studies. We have an incredible outpatient parenteral antibiotic therapy program called OPAT. Essentially, you come into the hospital, you have an infection, you need intravenous antibiotics instead of pills but we don't want you to stay in the hospital. You don't want to stay in the hospital. We don't want you to stay in the hospital. How do we get you home? Well, it was developed about five years ago between us and the, and the Department of Nursing, and it was the, the, the real goal was to get people home so that you didn't have to stay for four weeks in the hospital on treatment for a bone infection, for instance. And so with these outpatient therapies, you go home with a, a interaction between the Jewish general staff, the pharmacy staff, and the public health CLSC staff. Um, patients get this incredible brochure that we've put together with all kinds of instructions, emergency numbers, what to do, et cetera, who to contact. Most patients get a semi-permanent catheter put in, which is a simple 15-minute procedure in the x-ray department called a PICC line. This PICC line goes into their vein, and it stays there for the whole four to six to eight to 12 weeks of therapy. All the blood is drawn through there. All of the antibiotics are given through there so that you never have to be pricked with a needle. It's a wonderful way of sending you home with this. And a lot of them go home, a lot of the patients go home with these computerized pumps that they wear on their belt that automatically feeds the antibiotics into the catheter into them. How many people do we send home per year? Just last year alone, we sent 220 patients home with OPAT, with a PICC line in their arm usually, and every year we go up by 25%. So for the past five years, we've gone up 25% every year. There's always more patients to go home. Most of these patients had bone infections or skin infections, and we saved these patients and the hospital 5,200 days in the hospital. They spent them at home with their family. Some of them went back to work. I know one 18-year-old who went home with a catheter in his arm and played basketball three times a week, okay, on and with the antibiotics infusing into him because he didn't want to stop his basketball games. We've worked with over 29 different CLSCs, and Sonia Jolie, who's the main liaison person for the Department of Nursing, is in incredible. She has the patience of Job to work with 29 different CLSCs and all of the problems that goes on with each of them. Um, and that's just a small overview of what we do in infectious diseases. Now the lab. The lab works every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to detect infectious diseases. We are a large diagnostic microbiology lab. We have over 26 full-time medical technologists, and we have been cited repeatedly as the most efficient lab in Quebec. When the Regie puts out their statistics, we spend the least number of dollars per tests done. That's all the labs, especially in microbiology. What do we do? You know, everybody says, well, what do you, exactly do you do in there? I walk by and I look in and you all seem so busy, but what are you doing? Well, we process about 4,000 throat cultures, 34,000 urine cultures, 93 per day. We do about 14,000 blood cultures per year, 20,000, I know nobody likes the word pus, but that's what I live with every day. 20,000, my kids have gotten used to it already. 20,000 pus and body fluid cultures per year, 18,000 TB cultures per year, all right? And 1,700 virus cultures, many of which, all of this are done on agar plates manually. It's a very labor-intensive lab, very manual, no machinery in a, in, a, in a major part of the lab. We've tried to automate, okay, where we can automate is with the blood tests. We do over 8,000 HIV tests per year, and 1% of them come out positive. 
We do over 19,000 hepatitis B tests per year and 5,000 hepatitis A tests per year. This volume is way too big to do manually. We've given up the manual methods and have gone for robotic machines. These robotic machines are able to go into the tube of blood, take the blood out, do the test, and based on an algorithm that we've given the machine, depending on whether the test is positive or negative, it goes back into the tube and does further testing depending on what we tell it to do. And it's all done automatically with the test results being automatically downloaded into the computer system so that there's instant access on the computer screens in the hospital. Um, automation is the way to go in the lab. Unfortunately, we still do a lot of things very tediously and manually. Blood cultures is one of the ways that we've tried to go completely automated. We used to take blood from a patient to look for bacteria that's circulating in them, and we used to have to do a manual method of putting them on agar plates and looking for bacteria to grow. Very tedious and time consuming. Now we have purchased a machine that actually every 10 minutes there's a scanner that goes by and reads a special substance on the bottom of the tube that tells us whether bacteria are growing. It's instantly interfaced with the computer and as soon as a blood culture becomes positive, the computer rings an alarm, the technician goes over and we're able to call the doctor and tell them that there's bacteria in the bloodstream. So these are the kinds of things that we try to do. This is an example of TB cultures. We have two gigantic robotic machines to do TB cultures. Each drawer has 320 cultures in it. There's 960 cultures per machine. There's two machines, so we have 1,920 cultures for TB going on on any given day, and they're read automatically by the same kind of sensor that goes along the bottom of the machine to read each tube every hour. Our lab is automated. We automate it just the same way you go to Provigo or IGA. We automate it with barcodes so that we know exactly that this is your specimen and only your specimen. It's barcoded in red, and our lab is completely paperless. Everything is entered directly into the computer. There is no paper in the lab. It is all electronic. Now, what is the future in diagnostic clinical microbiology to detect infectious diseases? The future is molecular biology. There is no question that we cannot continue to do manual, tedious methods for looking for these infectious diseases. It, we just don't have the manpower, and we don't have the time, and we don't have the money. So the way to detect these infectious diseases is to look for their DNA or RNA or proteins. Every living organism has DNA and RNA. RNA, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, a cat, a human being, or a bird. Everything has unique DNA, and you can find that organism, whether it's a one virus or one bacteria, by looking for its DNA and amplifying it. So what do we mean by amplifying it? We take one piece of DNA from this virus or bacteria in whatever specimen we get from you, whether it's a urine, a sputum, a blood, whatever it is, and then we amplify it essentially by raising and lowering lowering the temperature in something called a thermocycler and by putting in special enzymes to make new copies. So we start off with one virus with one copy of DNA. And then by raising the temperature, we split it apart into two different sides. We then add enzymes to make exact duplicate copies and then we cool it down so that they come together and we now have two identical twin copies of the original piece. That's one cycle. We do that again a second time so each each of these two pieces is now replicated into the same twin pair of identical pieces. So two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. Each of these cycles is 45 seconds. That means after one hour from one piece of DNA and one virus, I now have over a billion DNA particles, and a billion is much easier to find than one. And with the molecular methods that we have in the lab now, we can find a billion copies pretty much within about 15 minutes. So after about an hour and 15 minutes, instead of three, four, five, six days, we can now find infectious diseases. This is not theory. This is what we do in my lab today. We use molecular biology looking for DNA, RNA, or proteins for tuberculosis. 
this for chlamydia and gonorrhea, which are the two most common sexually transmitted diseases. Almost all our hepatitis C testing is now molecular biology. We look for viral meningitis and herpes infections of the brain. We'd like to very soon move on to pertussis, which is not a big problem here, but a big problem amongst the kids. Um, superbugs, this is a big, big issue right now. MRSA, which is one of the superbug staph infections, and VRE, which is another superbug, multi-resistant to antibiotics. This is pretty much the scourge of most healthcare institutions all over the world. And by finding these bugs quickly, we know who's positive and who's negative when we can isolate appropriately. We have just finished a study with a Quebec City company where we can now detect MRSA in a patient in one hour and 10 minutes instead of five days, okay? But there's a cost associated with this. Um, this is a revolutionary test. This is going to revolutionize healthcare, this test, and it is now uh, undergoing licensing. And we can do other uh, detection uh, things as well. This is the robotic machine that detects MRSA and um, the other infectious diseases. So I told you about automation. I told you about molecular biology. These are the perfect machines because they are automated molecular biology. They detect billions of copies of DNA automatically by robotics. We have this one in our TB lab, and this is the one that will be used for MRSA detection. These are done connected to a simple uh, personal computer PC, and by putting specimens in, we have 16 specimens at a time. We're going to have two of these machines side by side. That's 32 specimens in one hour and 15 minutes. We'll have 32 results, whether you're carrying MRSA or not. And I, I doubt whether there's not at least 50% of the audience who has somebody who has already been infected or colonized with MRSA or has heard of MRSA by somebody being in this or any other hospital. It's become such a, a widespread phenomenon. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about before the question and answer period is infection prevention and control. Infection prevention Prevention and control is around us all the time. When you go and wash your hands, you're preventing infection. When you go and disinfect your kitchen counter, when you go and you know wash a tabletop, you're, you're practicing infection control. When you prepare your foods and you cook them, or whether the city of Montreal is purifying your water, everybody's doing their part for infection control. But most of us don't give it a second thought until there are problems. What kind of problems can we have? Well, we can have hospital-based problems, and you've already heard about superbugs and getting infected after surgery, that's our problem, and it's your problem when you come in. We have community-based infection control problems, and we have personal problems, okay? What do we do in the hospital? We have two and a half full-time infection control nurses. They're constantly doing surveillance and trying to prevent transmission of infections here. I'm the infection control officer. I love that because it sounds like people salute me, but they don't. Um, we have a part-time support staff. Um, we were just recently written up in the Pulse here. Very very, very active service. I mean, this can consume 80 hours of our week individually if we let it, all right? We do education of the staff. We review all the policies and procedures related to everything that goes on in the hospital in order to minimize infection. We do monthly multidisciplinary meetings. We have extensive surveillance programs. I know every surgeon and what their infection rate is. I know every program and what their infection rate is. I know every bug circulating in the hospital. I know outbreaks before they happen, okay? And that's where we are ahead of the game to try to prevent all this from going on. And sometimes we find ourselves behind the eight ball, and sometimes we're actually proactive and are able to do quite a bit. In the hospital, for example, you might see this type of thing all over the walls. We were the first hospital in Montreal to put alcohol-based hand rinse everywhere next to the elevators outside the patient rooms. The patients love it. The visitors love it. We love it. Uh, we think it's done a great deal in order to enhance infection control and to prevent transmission of infection in the hospital. It's a great little thing. For those of you who go up on the floors, you'll see it pretty much everywhere. It's instead of hand washing when you can't get to a sink. We ensure sterility of medical equipment. Equipment. We maintain an infection-free uh, infection air quality for the patients. We have a, um, a bone marrow transplant area. We have a leukemia treatment area. They have to be maintained clean. We've got construction, thanks to Mr. Elbaz and the money coming in. We have construction going on all the time, which unfortunately gives us great headaches because we have to keep the patients safe while the construction's going on. We love the construction, but we hate the construction because it means that we're busier. So we've got all kinds of barriers and special methods 
involved to keep the patient safe while we have the construction going on. We keep detailed statistics of all the infections going on in the hospital. We have an extensive computer database. We now have a, co a consultant coming in to completely revise our thing to make instant reports. And this is an example of the garb that we were wearing this past summer when we had people coming in with presumptive SARS. Anytime we had somebody coming into the emergency room with symptoms compatible of SARS, this is what our healthcare workers were wearing. This is a major headache to put together. We had teams. We spent countless hours preparing for these patients. Thank goodness nobody uh, in Montreal or the province of Quebec had SARS, but the preparation for SARS took just as much time as actually having cases. Um, and this is what we continue to do at this time as well because we don't know if it's going to recur or not. Um, and we also have has hospital lab safety and of course we deal with outbreaks. We try to prevent people being exposed to contaminated needles. We have needle containers everywhere in the hospital so that they don't wind up in the garbage. And of course, as a hospital, we have a tremendous amount of hazardous garbage that has to be dealt with. That's another issue that we have to deal with as well. Okay, these are the things that we take for granted in North America. Cleanliness, disinfection, vaccination, and sterile medical supplies. I'm not gonna go through all these examples because I don't have time, but essentially when things break down and you no longer can take things for granted, bad things happen, okay? There's no question that despite everybody's best intention, when you don't have a system that's 100% and when you, when you look the other way and, and you, you're not on your guard, problems will occur. Uh, we had the meningitis outbreak in 1990, um, at least 340, uh, 304 uh, cases, most of whom were adolescents who died in this outbreak. Um, and then we had another 5% of these individuals who needed amputations, 2% of them were left deaf. It was a horrible outbreak. Um, essentially, what did it require? It required a huge mobilization of the public health force, vigilance by everybody in the hospitals, as soon as you had a case, they had to get antibiotics before you even mentioned their name in the emergency room, they were getting antibiotics. And 1.6 million people were vaccinated to the tune of $25.5 million over a four month period, all in order to contain an outbreak that unfortunately got into the community. This is, this is what you have to do. These are the vaccines that we get here in North America that we take for granted. And nobody gets boosted when they go traveling into the developing world because they think these diseases don't exist anymore. But these diseases, are common everywhere outside of North America and Western Europe, okay? The number one cause of neonatal death in Africa is tetanus because they cut the umbilical cord with rusty knives, okay? And that's what happens when you cut an umbilical cord with a rusty knife out in the field, the baby dies of tetanus. Tetanus, we haven't seen cases of tetanus in Canada in 10 years, all right? But tetanus exists on a daily basis in Africa. Example two was the measles outbreak. Why did the measles outbreak occur? I'm not gonna get into the details of the measles outbreak, Essentially, it occurred because one batch of vaccine that was made in 1980 was not as potent as the manufacturer thought it was. And there was a whole group of people who were left susceptible, and when measles was introduced into the population, it spread like wildfire. So again, there had to be an, a huge public health task force and, and revaccination of people for measles. Tainted ice cream. I, I wonder how many of you heard about this. There were 224,000 people sick in three states in the United States back in 94 with diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And it was traced by some public health interventionalists, some, some infection control people, to the Schwann's ice cream plant. Why Schwann's? Why? Because they broke the, the, the number one rules of infection control, okay, which is keep the dirty and the clean apart. All right, what did they do? They found that the ice cream mix was transported in the same tanker trucks that were transporting unpasteurized eggs that had been broken in an egg breaking plant. For those of you who don't know how food preparation goes on with the world the way it is now, food is made in huge quantities. There are egg breaking plants that break millions of eggs a day and transport the liquid eggs to people who use them like bakeries and other food manufacturing plants. So when you see a tanker going by on the highway, it may not just contain oil, it can contain milk, it can contain liquid eggs, it can contain paint, you name it. 
And this company was transporting liquid eggs, and of course liquid eggs come from chickens and carry salmonella. Their tankers were supposed to be cleaned before they went to the next job, but they cut corners, because who has time these days? And of course cleaning costs money, so if you don't pay them to clean, then you save money. So what did they do? They then took the same trucks after they dumped off all the liquid eggs, and they went to the Schwann's plant to pick up the liquid ice cream. When they picked up the liquid ice cream, they delivered it to the plants that made the ice cream, but of course ice cream is not cooked, it was only frozen, and they froze all this salmonella tainted ice cream. And then you wound up with 224,000 people infected from dirty ice cream. Same thing in Milwaukee. Everybody talks about Walkerton, but way before Walkerton, there was Milwaukee. Milwaukee in 1993, 400,000 people affected with watery diarrhea. In a three month period, 100 of them died, all because of a parasite called Cryptosporidia. How did that happen? This time it wasn't the trucker's fault. What was the problem? Cows carry Cryptosporidia. It's a normal parasite of cows. When cows eat, they defecate into the fields, okay? Cow dung contains cryptosporidia. When it rains, the cryptosporidia gets washed into the rivers. Unfortunately, in Milwaukee, they had a very heavy rainfall and they had a flood. The flood put the water from the fields into the, into the rivers and lakes and into the water supply and overloaded the municipal water plant, which couldn't filter out the water. And when it came out of the taps of the people, they they got sick and wound up sitting on the toilet and worse. So here you have a system which Mother Nature was more potent than any trucking company in making half a million people sick, all because of basic infection control processes. And here there was no shortcut except somebody might say that if the water purification plant was better, this wouldn't have happened. But there really wasn't any fault to be shown. It was a natural disaster. And personal infection control, this is what we call the infection control that you're supposed to do for yourself, for your family and friends and to the community, what types of things, washing your hands, staying away from other people when you're sick, staying away from them when they're sick, okay? Ensuring that your hairdresser's tools, your podiatrist's tools, your ear piercer's tools, if you go in for tattoos, your tattooer's tools are all sterile, okay? How many of you know how your hairdresser's combs and brushes and everything are handled? Well, I can tell you that they're not handled well. All right. We insist on certain things for people who come into the hospital. The podiatrists who come into the hospital and deal with our patients have to have sterile instruments. They have to be disinfected between use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you go to a podiatrist in an office on Cote de Neige, downtown, whatever, I challenge you whether you know what they do with their instruments. And sometimes people bleed and there's blood on the instruments. What do they do between people? Okay. These are the things I'll bet you nobody's asked. You probably didn't know was important. How many of you have received the appropriate vaccines? The pneumonia vaccine, the flu vaccine, all of the other things to prevent disease rather than treat it when you get it. How many of you actually avoid undercooking chicken? I know when I go skiing and I stand in line, and everybody eats hamburgers when you go skiing, and I stand in line and everybody's ordering hamburgers, and then I look at these hamburgers, and it's not just theoretical because there have been numerous outbreaks of E. coli at ski centers, but when you stand in line and you see how undercooked these hamburgers are, you know, as a personal choice I've made, I love hamburgers. I won't eat hamburgers at a fast food place like a ski hill where it's uncontrolled because there have been outbreaks of E. coli and really it's just not a prudent thing. So I've made a personal decision for myself um, and taking the appropriate precautions when you're traveling outside of the developed countries. Again, taking the right malaria pills, getting the right vaccines before you go, finding out what to eat and what not to eat. These are the personal choices to keep yourself healthy. So with that, now you know everything about infectious diseases, clinical microbiology, infection prevention and control, and I almost kept to the time, almost, in a little over 60 minutes, because I was starting late, and I thank you for your attention.